Live from Santa Clara, California, it's the Cube covering Open Networking Summit 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Santa Clara, California at the Open Networking Summit 2017. I'm joined uh, this whole show by my co-host, Scott Rainovich. Scott, great to see you. And we're excited in this segment to get one of the keynote uh, presenters to come down and spend some time with us on theCUBE. So Sandra Rivera, she's the Corporate VP and GM of Network Platforms Groups at Intel. Welcome. Thank you. And your keynote is all about 5G. 5G is now. <laughs> 5G is happening um, now. That is a powerful declarative statement. Well, indeed, but it's true. It's true. Yes, if you look at um, 5G being the true convergence of computing and communications, then you see that so much of the capabilities that we have had in the cloud and in the core of the network really need to scale out to both the edge and the access network to be ever closer to the end user or the endpoint. It could right. be a smartphone, it could be a laptop, it could be a, a, a tablet, or it could be some of the new devices that we see, drones and robots and connected cars. So this idea that we have to bring programmable, scalable, flexible computing closer to those endpoints is really the foundation upon which 5G is going to be built. And all of that is really what we're driving with software-defined networking and network functions virtualization. So 5G is indeed happening now. Yeah, and this is really a continuation of the theme from Mobile World Congress just a few, I guess, a few just weeks a, ago. Uh, time, time flies. Is it a few weeks? Is I, don't I, know, I think it's I a couple months. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, 5G at Mobile Congress was all the rage, and we were talking a lot about what 5G will enable. So, connected cars, and smart cities, and smart factories, and smart homes, uh, as well as those immersive experiences uh, that you'll have uh, in your home, um, you know, cloud. Uh, gaming and uh, 3D uh, types of experiences and virtual reality or actually what we're calling merged reality, the ability to put physical objects in a virtual world or virtual objects in your physical world. So all of that requires way more bandwidth, uh, very low latency, and a much better responsiveness in that endpoint uh, near the, the device or the user, which is what all the innovations in 5G from a radio perspective will enable, but of course the rest of the infrastructure has to support it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, there was quite a bit of discussion at Mobile World Congress about 5G, and I think there was uh, a lot of questions also mm -hmm. being raised. If some of the <clears throat> the larger carriers, such as Deutsche Telekom, I think maybe Orange, mm -hmm. um, they were questioning the size of the investment that's mm -hmm. necessary, mm -hmm. and I think um, for some people, it threw the, the timeline yeah. into question a little bit, as we know, as, as we were discussing prior to the show, the standard, you know, 2000, we're looking at 2019, 2020 maybe right. for deployment. Right. Where, what's Intel's view on the, the de deployment timeline? Does that matter to you? Yeah, well it matters a lot because we are investing now and we're investing with a broad ecosystem of partners. If you look at it just from a pure radio perspective, yes indeed, the 3GPP spec for 5G doesn't really get nailed down until the end of 18. You'll start to see true compliant 5G devices introduced in 2019 and ramp and scale uh, in 2020. But the network infrastructure, that idea that you need this programmable, agile, composable infrastructure uh, really starts now because you're not going to be able to have a light switch of, well, this is the network that I need to support all of those devices and all those use cases. And that composability of the network is anchored on having a programmable uh, capability as opposed to a fixed function set of boxes or appliances, which is really how networks have been architected and built and deployed up until now. Um, and it embraces server volume economics, virtualization technologies and that pooling benefit that you get from sharing a, an underlying resource, as well as cloud architectures and cloud business models, the idea that you can pay as you go. Um, and, and you hear a lot uh, about network slicing, and that really is about composing the network for not too few or not too many resources that you need for that particular end use case. Mm -hmm. So all of that is happening now, and uh, we are participating with uh, Verizon in the 5G Tech Forum, we're working with uh, 
uh, KT and SKT as they get ready for the Winter Olympics. Uh, we're working with operators and uh, telecom equipment manufacturers all over the world to prove out connected car and smart cities and uh, smart factories types of use cases. So, um, so I think that there's always some healthy skepticism about, you know, are we over investing, are we investing too early? But if you look at the amount of work that we have to get done in what is a relatively short window of time, um, we feel like we actually need to mm -hmm. speed yeah. up. And 2019 is right around the corner, Scott. I mean, I can't believe we're already I, a third I haven't of marked on my calendar already. <laughs> it's right here. 5G <laughs> arrives. <laughs> the, uh, but what? I mean, what? Tell us the the play for Intel is to be in the NFV infrastructure for 5G. Is that is that your actually big play? Uh, Intel's strategy for 5G is end to end. So clearly, we have uh, modem technology mm -hmm. that will go into client devices. Yeah, yes, smartphones, yes, tablets, uh, yes, uh, laptops, but also drones and robots and cars and uh, and any number of devices that haven't even yet been invented. Uh, we we are in all of the infrastructure from the access layer uh, in terms of the base stations and a lot of the edge computing that is happening there. We're in the edge of the network, which could be uh, close to the enterprise or close to the consumer. And we're in the core of the network, which is where a lot of the uh, the switching and, and routing functions, the authentication uh, functions, the security uh, functions are, are done. Um, and then of course we are, you know, we power most of the world's uh, cloud infrastructure, so back into the cloud and the data center, right, that's, right. that's Intel. So it really is end to end. We have this broad view and this scalable architecture where it's a consistent silicon ar architecture, a common tool chain, and a very broad uh, access to ecosystem and developers to take you through that uh, end to end portfolio of services and capabilities that you require. So. Mm -hmm. Great. And at the end of the day, just eating up a lot of compute, right? Uh, lots of compute. <laughs> uh, if it's a Which compute problem, uh, you know, Intel pr feels pretty comfortable that we have leadership right, there. Right. Yep. Uh, indeed. Um, but we have some new announcements here. Okay. Because well. you're here. Besides yes, the keynote, you had announcements the keynote. too. Uh, we had some announcements uh, around our data plane development kit, or okay. DPDK. So Intel invented DPDK uh, in 2010. And that was a, a set of libraries and optimized drivers for running high performance packet processing on general purpose CPUs. And of course, if you're in the network business, it's all about moving the packets, so you need right, high performance right. packet processing. But the ability to have these optimized libraries for queue and buffer management, for flow classification, for quality of service, and run it on your standard server CPU is a very powerful capability because you no longer need purpose-built silicon to run those functions. So, uh, so we invented DPDK, we contributed into open source, it ran in an um, in an open source project called dpdk.org, but we announced on Monday of this week that that's moving to the Linux Foundation. We're broadening the community of developers. We are multi-architecture. Um, we are uh, very broad in terms of the developers that are contributing to DPDK, and we think that this is a fundamental building block of networks that will be, again, built and deployed uh, over time. So, so you'd already invented it, but you handed it over to Linux We Foundation. invented it and we contributed it, uh, right. it to open source actually some years ago into uh, a project called dpdk.org, but the announcement was that it was now moving into the Linux, uh, Linux, Linux Foundation hosted Foundation. project okay. because that gives us a, a broader umbrella right. uh, by which we can attract more developers and have greater contributions from a, a broad ecosystem. Right, and we saw AT&T just uh, gave a bunch of stuff to the Linux Foundation. Yeah, that's so right. Everybody's given it to the uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good place to be. It's a good so place I'm curious, kind of your take from the Intel perspective on you know this show specifically, but also more just kind of open source and generally, and yeah. you know, the role that Linux yeah. Foundation plays in taking a project sure. that was obviously of, of significant value, yeah. but 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 enabling it to go places maybe that it wouldn't if it wasn't part of the Indeed, foundation. yeah, so Intel is a big believer in open source, open standards, and a big enabler and investor in uh, broad ecosystems. Uh, we're consistently the, the number one or the number two contributor to many of the projects that we participate in, including Linux, the actual Linux kernel, right? right? Um, but from a networking projects uh, perspective, we really do uh, like the leadership that the Linux Foundation is uh, demonstrating in coalescing the industry around uh, some of the big problems and challenges as well as opportunities that we face together. Yes, we're live. <laughs> we are live, it's not staged. Um, 
And so we do believe that uh, having just a broader landing zone, if you will, for the work that we're right, contributing right. and having that parallelization that comes from a community of developers tackling the same problems together as opposed to one at a time or as opposed to doing the same thing in, in various places is very, very powerful. Right. So we're very happy to, uh, to be part of uh, many of these networking projects and of course we get a big supporter and partner to the Linux Foundation for many years. Okay. Yeah. So any, um, so yes, we're a third of the way or a quarter of the way through 2017, on yeah. our way to 2017, <laughs> or 19, the launch of 5G. Mm -hmm. Just curious, Sandra, kind of as you look at what you're working on in 2017, obviously the, the 5G mm -hmm. initiative and yeah. all the, the, the developments around that are very yeah. exciting. We really are excited about it for the IoT side. Mm -hmm. We don't really spend yes. as much time on the handset yeah. side per se, but obviously for IoT, it's yeah. very exciting. But what are some of the other kind of priorities you have for 2017 yeah. uh, that you're working on if we catch up a year from now that you can report back yeah. on? Yeah, well we definitely are driving towards the commercialization of NFV and SDN. Uh, we have been through a period of time of technical feasibility, a lot of early uh, lab trials uh, followed by field trials, but uh, but we are absolutely seeing now this uh, much broader scale of commercial deployments and we're going to see that throughout 2017 and 2018. Um, and we think that, that you know, clearly 5G acts as an accelerant to a lot of that work, a lot of the foundational work that needs to be done uh, in terms of network transformation and network virtualization enables 5G and then 5G uh, creates a compelling event for us to, to go faster. So, uh, so we're getting ready for some of the, the 2018 Olympics uh, types of, of demonstrations of early technologies uh, on the path to, to 5G in 2019 and 2020. Uh, but network transformation, network virtualization is a fundamental piece of that. Um, the other area that we're investing quite a bit in is data analytics. Uh, so uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, one of the things that we know is once we have programmable computing in all uh, parts of the network, in the entire spectrum from the client to the access to the edge, the core, and the cloud, that you can actually collect and harness that data and turn it into business value, uh, either upstream to the content providers or downstream to the consumers of, of the, the information or, or the data. And, uh, and we will see much more of that really uh, starting to come to fruition this year, not just in the big hyperscale cloud guys, but a lot of ways that uh, the enterprises can use data and turn that into business value. So we're pretty excited about everything that's happening on that front as well. I'm going to be a busy lady. We're busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well Sandra, thanks for stopping by. I know uh, from Overworld Congress we could only get you on the phone, so it's great to uh, actually get fun. to meet you in More person. More fun this way. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> all right. She's Sandra Rivera, he's uh, Scott Radovich, I'm Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE from Open Networking Summit 2017. We'll be back after this short break. Thanks for watching.